Good afternoon, welcome to my channel. I'm Dr. Paul Karitsis. Today I'm going to be telling you the tale of the sad nightingale, which is one of the one of the good ones. Once upon a time there was a king and queen with two children, a boy and a girl. They were both kind, good looking, they had everything happening for them. At twelve, the girl was absolutely gorgeous. She was the talk of the entire kingdom. All the men, all the noblemen rather, from around the country would always come to ask for her hand in marriage. But she didn't want to marry anyone because she enjoyed just being with her friends and playing with her brother. One morning the boy and girl were playing out in the courtyard and the young princess took off her white veil, a white veil that was embroidered with red roses and began waving it up in the air and playing with it and all of a sudden there was a a breeze, a, a strong gust of wind, it took the veil some distance away and her brother turns around and says, don't worry, I'll go and, I'll go and fetch it and then we'll continue our, our games. So he trods off to find the veil. Some time passes, he doesn't come back. The young princess is worried, she's like, I wonder what's happened to him. So she goes to look for him in the direction where the veil had disappeared. She looks through some, a clump of bushes. No, nothing. The only thing she could hear was the sound or the chirp of a sad nightingale. Didn't make any sense. He had vanished into thin air. She goes back to her parents. Mum, Dad, my brother's disappeared. Of course, given that he was a prince, everyone becomes very frazzled. All the guards come out to the courtyard to look for him. He's nowhere to be found though. Days, months pass, nothing. Of course, during this time, the princess had fallen into a, a deep sense of grief, of, of loss, of having lost her brother. The king and queen were also sad, though the king and queen at some stage thought, well, he's not, gonna, he's not coming back to us. We don't know where he's gone. We'll just have to accept it. The young princess did not accept it. She was just this very distressed and became more ill and more ill. One day, the king bursts into her chambers and says, daughter, what, what's going to make you happy? Like, you know, you've been like this for a long time. And she says, I want to see the sad nightingale. I really want to see the sad nightingale. The king's thinking, what's this sad nightingale business? Has she gone crazy? What sad nightingale do you speak of, daughter? I just want to see the sad nightingale. I want to bring me the sad nightingale. The king didn't know what that meant, so he goes out and decrees publicly. Noblemen, men, the young men of the kingdom, whoever can bring me the sad nightingale to put a smile on my daughter's face will have her hand in marriage. So you can imagine all these noblemen in the kingdom, they're all out searching for the sad nightingale. The news also reached the ears of a very rich merchant from the countryside. Uh, this man had, a, had one son whose name was Snooty, who was very proud and obnoxious, um, and a kind of a younger apprentice with him, uh, who was not his son, he, this, this other boy was an orphan. And um, though the orphan was very kind, good-natured and hard-working, both of the boys wanted to go and look for the sad nightingale. So, the rich merchant said, okay, both of you can go. You know, inside of him he's thinking, well, what's this, what's this young man going to do, you know, in front of my son if I don't, if I don't give him anything uh, with which to get somewhere. So basically he gave his own son a horse, a bird cage, um, plenty of money so that he would have on the way. And for the young apprentice, he gave a bag with bit of cheese and a bit of bread just so that just enough to just enough to satisfy his hunger and his um his very his lower carnal needs so both the boys take off together but then they eventually separate the young boy was quite smart because he also took something with him which would became useful a lot later and that was a pair of scissors that had been bequeathed to him by his 
own mother before she had passed away. So here they are, off to find this sad nightingale. A sad nightingale that no one knows anything about. Of course, Snorty was first, so he reaches a place uh, uh, where there was a crossroad, um, and there he found a woman who was dressed in rags and basically in a terrible condition, both physically and mentally. She was skinny, she was wrinkled, she was shivering, uh, she was looked like she was in a state of shock, kind of huddled, sitting on a rock, cradling herself and just holding a foot and with both hands and just screaming out in pain. Help me, please, I'm in pain, I'm not well at all. Snorty, basically trotting by on his horse, says, Oh, whatever, I don't really help pitiful creatures like you, you're beyond help, woman. And continues going. Next up, the young apprentice comes by, though she didn't need to call out for him to become attentive to her. He saw her from a while back and saw that she was in quite a bit of a distress and and basically stops and says, what's wrong? Why, why, are you, why are you so distressed? And she basically turns around and says to him, May the good fortune bless you, young man. I can't believe you actually stopped for me. There's a thorn that's basically digging into my foot and it's causing me a lot of pain. I can't seem to reach it. Can you please help me get it out? So the boy basically gets on his knees and looks, looks around, feels around her foot and finds it and then pulls it straight back out. And she says, thank you so much, young man. Thank you very much. You're the first person to offer me this help. And of course, I'm someone who enjoys helping people too. So if you, you know, if you need any help, let me know and I'll help you. And then he says, yeah, I might need some help with something. And she says, go on. I." I know quite a lot of things about the world, about the universe, and I can help you. Of course, the boy didn't really believe what she was talking about. He says, thank you, um, but I don't know, I, I'm, I don't know if you can help me with this, but I'm, I'm trying to find the sad nightingale. And she turns around and says, ah, the sad nightingale. And then she said, I can tell you where that is. And then he goes, really? And she goes, yeah. She goes, why do you want to find the sad nightingale? Because I want to make the princess smile again. The young princess smile. Okay, I can tell you where that bird is. She said, do you see over there? It's beyond the lofty mountains. Beyond those precipitous cliffs. There's six of them. There's six peaks. And beyond that, there's the seventh, which is known as the untrodden peak. Nobody has ever been there. It's far too difficult to climb those cliffs. But I can see that you're an extremely resilient boy and that you know you 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 will get there if you actually give it a shot. And he says, okay, well I, I'm willing to try that. She said there's a few things that you should know about it though. Up there on the untrodden peak there's also a cave and near this cave or guarding this cave there's a giant. There's a very, he's very hairy. He's a very hairy giant. He's sometimes very good and sometimes not as good. Sometimes a bit evil. So, if you make a good impression on him though, he'll help you get to the sad nightingale. Find the sad nightingale. You have my blessings, young man, to find what you are seeking. And I only give my blessing once every hundred years. But it does not fail those to whom I bequeath it. So go on your way and let the food supply that you have there never run out. Then she vanishes into thin air. The boy looks around, he thinks, where's she gone? Perhaps she was a fairy, perhaps she was a witch, perhaps she was a goddess even. So he takes off on this pilgrimage, stopping occasionally to rest, uh, near streams to drink water, his food supply never ran out. So he walks, he walks more, he walks more, he loses all this weight, stopping at springs to drink, he climbs higher, higher and higher and higher until he reaches the cave 
where the untrodden on the untrodden peak. He looks around, he thinks, oh, where's this giant? The giant's right in front of him. Often we don't see things that are right in front of us. The giant's very hairy. The only place where there isn't hair on the giant is his nose and a bit on his forehead. But the rest of his body is completely covered in hair. The boy looks at him a little bit, thinks, hmm, very odd looking giant. And then he sees that the giant is actually tapping various parts on the on the ground so he can't see properly so he's blind as well of course the boy was quite brave so he says long life and happiness to you giant i can give you whatever you need ask anything of me and it is yours of course hearing those words the giant was in shock he kind of jumped back and then you know his arm swung out and swung out his arm and he tried to hit wherever the, um, the sound was coming from. But he missed because the boy was quite swift and jumped back in time. Who's there? Who's disrupting? Who's disrupting my home and my solitude? The boy you know, jumps back and very calmly says, I'm here. I told you that I would offer you anything you need, but if I can give you what you need, you need to promise me that you can give me what I want or that you'll, that you'll listen to what I want. And he says, ah, so you want a favor. Of course, the favor that I want, young man, I don't think you can give me. And he said, come on, go to, tell me, tell me what you want and I'll give it to you. Well, I don't think you can give me what I want and I want my sight back. So I don't think you can give me that, can you? And he says, the young boy says, but I can give you my, your sight back. And he whips out the scissors that his mum had given him before she'd passed away and trudges up to the giant and grabs his fringe. There was a long fringe in front of the giant that reached nearly up to his nose and just snips it. There's your sight back, he said. There you go. The giant's like, oh my God, you're twice my size and I can't believe that you were able to give me my sight back. You're amazing. You're an amazing young man and you're quite brave too because no one's dared come up to me and speak to me like in that particular way. Okay, well, I told you and the young boy says, I told you that I'd give you what you need but you need to give me what I need too. And he says, go ask anything you want, young man. Ask me and I'll tell you. And he says, the young boy says, Please tell me how to find the sad nightingale. And he says, ah, the sad nightingale. So you're after the sad nightingale. Okay, I'll tell you how to find the, side, the sad nightingale. So he basically takes a little bit of his hair and just... Actually, it wasn't his hair. It was his beard. So he plucks his beard. And there was a, cha a, a chain around the giant's neck with a key on it. So he pulls that off as well and he gives them to the young to the young apprentice and he says here you go okay, do you see up, work, work your way up to the cave open that door go straight through at the back of the cave there is an iron door use the key to unlock it walk straight through there's a ledge so there's a precipice and a ledge don't be scared once you get to the end of the ledge light the hair and a miracle will happen and he says okay I'll, I'll do that I'll do that so he basically takes what the giant gave him and then he just walks through so he goes up walks up to the cave opens the cave walks through all these beautiful looking stalactites and stalagmites and um, reaches the end of the cave and then inserts the key into the lock but the door handle didn't need to be turned it opened on its own he walks right through and he's suddenly shocked to see you know see this cliff and there's a huge drop so anyone that falls from there is pretty much finished and then he walks and then he's looking down and then all of a sudden the door shuts behind him and then he's like but he didn't flinch he thinks okay let me just do what the giant told me so he lights he lights the hair and all of a sudden there's a miracle and this winged horse appears before him and says what do you want?
what do you want, young man? And the young man says, I need you to take me to the nightingale. And the horse goes, hop on my back. So he gets on the horse, the horse takes off, and all of a sudden they're flying. And he can see rivers, swamps, prairies, you name it, forests, lakes, everything. Bird's eye view of everything. They progress, they progress, and all of a sudden they reach this other mountain, which is nearly twice as tall as the one before. So they traverse all these fields and, and reach these very, very, very tall mountains. And then the boy thinks, oh my God, how are we going to get through this? We can't fly over it. We can't fly over this peak. It's too high. And the horse says, don't worry. This, is, this mountain splits in half. So every so often. And as the horse said, the mountain parted and the horse shot right through before the mountains could close again. So they, they go through to the other side and he says, okay, they descend, they descend onto this platform and the horse grounds itself and says, okay, get off. This is where the sad nightingale is. Just in amongst there, there's some bushes over there. Look, go and look for it, but be very, very, very quick because here in this particular area, this particular zone, there lives dragons as you can see there's you can't see them but they exist and then the boy goes where are they and he goes well they're up in these towers do you see the towers around us there's 40 of them and then the boy looked and he thought oh yeah I can see these towers and the winged horse says well that's where the dragons live so you need to be really quick before we wake them up and um, the boy said okay well okay so he goes out and where could he look first there were bird noises coming from everywhere. But he all of a sudden, he just stops and he thinks, okay, try and listen for a sound that's a noise that's sad, a, a, a wistful, a sad noise, because this nightingale is obviously depressed, so he'll be issuing a very sad cry. So he stops and he listens, and then he all of a sudden locates this sound that's coming from a lemon tree or from near a lemon tree so he basically walks his way walks his way there makes his way there and he looks down and on a marble seat there's this other young princess who's seated and seems to be sleeping with the sad nightingale sitting on her lap on the cloth on the white silk cloth so he thinks, okay, how am I going to take it from her without her waking up? I've got to be very, very careful. So he scoops down and picks up the nightingale. And he thinks, okay, I've got it now. The nightingale didn't make any noise. So he was lucky there. And then he shoots off with the nightingale. But the girl that was sitting on the marble seat woke up and she was like, Brothers! We have a thief here, he's taken the nightingale from me. And all of a sudden, these 40 dragons slither out from the towers and make their way down to where the, the girl was seated. But by this time, the young apprentice had already made his way back to the horse. And the horse, mount, he mounts the horse and the horse, the winged horse takes off. And of course the dragons are out behind them running and throwing stones and throwing everything that they could lay their hands on. But by that time, the winged horse had, was too far, too far. So the winged horse goes back to where the mountain is, where the mountain that opens and closes is. But of course the dragons have wings too, so they're following, though they are much slower. So they're waiting, so the, so the winged horse is circling over there, waiting for the, for the mountain to open, for the two sides to open, and the dragons are right behind them. And he's thinking, quick, 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 quick. We need to get through. As soon as the mountain starts opening, the doors, of the two sides of the mountain, the horse shoots right through. And of course, the dragons couldn't follow because they were too slow. They would be crushed if they followed because the, the two sides slammed shut promptly. The young apprentice breathes a sigh of relief. He thinks, oh, God, thank God we've made it. So they fly all the way back to the, the other side where the other mountain was. They get off and 
The boy nods to the horse and says, thank you very much for helping me. And he makes his way back through the cave to where the hairy giant was. And he says, look, giant, I've got it. I've got the sad little nightingale. And the giant says, well done. Well done, you're a brave young man. So now you need to best be on your way and go and see the princess. And he says, you know, may luck be with you. And the young boy says, I'll never forget you. Thank you very much for your kindness and your generosity. And uh, I'll never forget you. So the, so the young apprentice starts making his way down to the mountain, descending, stopping from time to time to eat, drink, have a sleep. Of course, the food that was in his bag would never run out. So he ate, he drank, and then all of a sudden, within a few days, he was back to the crossroads. Of course, at the crossroads, the, the old woman who he had seen days before wasn't there, though he now bumps into Snooty, who was not, not, very, not very happy at all. He was, you know, his clothes were torn. He was basically looked miserable, uh, dirty. He'd lost, he'd lost his horse. So he was sitting down, basically skulking. And the young apprentice walks by and says, what's going on, Snooty? You, you don't look very well. And he says, and then Snooty looks up and he goes, why, are you well? And he goes, well, I found the sad nightingale. So here it is. So let's go back to the palace and, um, you know, I'll marry the princess and you can live with us and we'll all be happy. Of course, Snooty uh, thinks to himself, oh, he's got it. He found the sad nightingale. He thinks, well, I'm not going to, I'm not happy with this arrangement. I'm going to, I'll find a way to, you know, I'll find a way to reverse roles. So he says, well, now that you found it, before we head off to the palace, let's, you know, sit and have a bit of a feed. And the young prince says, yeah, no problems. And, you know, they sits and shares the bread and the, the bread and with, um, with his mate and the cheese. And the, the um, snooty says, okay, well, how are we going to get water? Because I'm thirsty. There's a well over there. How about, how about we lower each other and, you know, we'll both, we'll both get, get some water. You know, I'll, um, you lower me first and then I'll lower you and you can have a drink. And he says, okay, okay. He goes, but, you know, before we lower each other down to the well so that we can take a sip of water, why don't we put the bird in the cage? I've still got the cage that my dad gave me so that it doesn't fly away. And the young apprentice says, yeah, no problems. We can put it in the cage. But the young apprentice is quite cunning, always a step ahead of Snooty because he keeps the white silk scarf with the embroidered scarlet roses, he puts it in his pocket. Anyway, so Snooty goes first and the young apprentice lowers him into the well. He takes a sip of water, comes back out. Then it's, um, it's the young apprentice's turn. He, he's lowered successfully to the, to the bottom of the well. He takes a sip of, sip of water. And then of course, what does Snooty do? He takes the bird and flees, runs, runs to the palace leaving the young apprentice there. He goes to the palace and says, I need to see the king and queen. I have the sad nightingale. Of course, the princess hearing this jumps out of her bed and runs and says, where, where's the sad nightingale? He says, here it is, princess. So they're all at the royal court and Snooty is basically showing the princess the sad nightingale. But the sad nightingale was still sad, didn't want to sing. Didn't, wasn't, wasn't in any mood to sing. So the princess goes back to her bed and she falls into her bed again, even more distressed than before. And the king and queen are thinking, okay, what's, what's wrong with his border, the sad nightingale? Why isn't she happy? Of course, during this time, a shepherd had gone by the well and had seen that the young apprentice was stuck in there and pulled him out. And he said, what's wrong? What happened? Well, why were you in the well for? And he says, Long story, can't explain. I'll explain to you next time. And he goes off, runs to the, um, to the palace and starts knocking on the outside gate and saying, open the doors, open the doors. I've been robbed. And the king and queen are, you know, thinking, what's, go what's going on there? And the princess, of course, who had heard all the commotion, basically came out to the window. 
so she could listen in as to what was happening. Open the doors. There's this, there's this snooty guy that's basically stolen my sad nightingale and, 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 you know, he left me down in the well. So the princess basically runs down and says to the guards, open the doors. I want to hear what this guy's got to say. So they open the door and he comes through and he proceeds before the royal court and where the king and queen were and says, this sad nightingale was stolen from me. And Snooty, of course, as soon as he saw him, he was like, oh my God, he's here. So he was quite embarrassed. He was in shock. Um, the king and queen said, explain yourself. Is this what you did? And Snooty made up some excuses, though none of them made any sense. And then the young apprentice says, and I can prove to you that it belonged to me and that I'm the one that actually retrieved it from where it was. And then the king and queen said, how are you going to do that? Then he pulls out the white silk scarf with the scarlet red roses embroidered onto it. And he says, here is, here it is. This is what you're looking for. And the princess, upon seeing the white veil, just jumps up and says, yes, he's telling the truth. And she grabs it and she puts it on her lap, opens the cage and the sad nightingale comes out. And as soon as she lays the sad nightingale on her lap, on the veil, it starts to sing. So the sad nightingale is happy again. And of course, this makes the princess happy, who then brings the nightingale up and gives it a kiss. And the kiss basically transforms the nightingale back into the young boy, the long lost brother. So, of course, the, the young man who had brought the nightingale, the young apprentice, was happy beyond words. He was like, yes, we've done it. And he was happy because he had basically reunited his sister with her brother. And the brother, of course, was changed into, was changed into a nightingale by a witch or a sorceress who wanted to give it to the sister of the 40 dragons as a gift. So the whole family fell into each other's arms. They were all happy. They were all in a state of bliss. There was singing, dancing afterwards. Um, they were all, all extre extremely happy to be reunited. So they feasted for nine specific days. Three of those days were spent celebrating the return of the brother. Three of them, the fact that the sad nightingale was returned by the apprentice and the other three, the wedding of the young apprentice to the young princess. So we have a situation here, which was a very, very happy ending. Of course, the king wanted to punish the liar, Snooty. Um, but the young apprentice intervened and basically there was a pardon that was issued for him. So the, from that point onwards, Snooty basically uh, lost his, um, lost his ugly disposition of being a very proud, of being a very proud man. And um, they all lived happily, happily ever after. And the young apprentice would from that time onwards always basically travel out to the untrodden peak and see the giant where he would snip the giant's, the giant's hair, his fringe every year so that he could see because hair obviously grows and uh, we need to cut it. Otherwise it does obscure our vision. That's the story. So it's a, uh, they all lived happily ever after. Of course, I think we all love happy endings. That's what stories are about. They're about happy endings. And um, yeah, so I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, I hope you join me next time for the next story. See you then.